Hello, my name is Bai Li from the University of Toronto. And today I'm going to be presenting my work called Wood Class Flexibility, a Deep Contextualized Approach. So what is Wood Class Flexibility? Wood Class Flexibility is when a single word can be used as multiple parts of speech. So for example, the word bike can be used as a noun, I bought a new bike at the store, or as a verb, he bikes to work every day. Similarly, the word sleep can be used as a verb, I want to sleep early today, or as a noun, I didn't get enough sleep last night. But in English, not every word can be used as both noun and verb. So the word car can be used as a word, as a noun, I have a fast car, but you cannot say he cars to work, you can only say he drives to work. But in some languages, it's been claimed that all words are flexible. Here's an example of a, a language called Mundari, spoken in India. And in this language, the word bu means mountain as a noun, or it means to heap up as a verb. Now, theoretical views of flexibility. There's multiple ways of viewing flexibility. It can You can view it first as having an underspecified word class. So a word like sleep, it doesn't have a word class um, by default until you work, use it in a sentence. Then it either becomes a verb in the context of a sentence or a noun in the sentence. Now, a second way of viewing it is as conversion. So a word does have a base word class like verb and uh, sometimes it gets converted to a noun. Now, there's a few ways you can determine the directionality if you believe in the directionality hypothesis and not the under specification one. So first one is frequency. So, so this criterion says the more frequent part of speech is the dominant one. If a word has more usage as a noun, then it's dominant noun. Otherwise, if it's uh, more often used as a verb, then it's verb dominant. A second criterion is history. So this means that the part of speech that's earlier attested is dominant one. So if it's, if it's first used as a noun in 1300 and then as a verb in 1500, then it's non -do noun dominant. The problem with this is that native English speakers don't know when a word first appeared in this language. So it's kind of weird to say that this is a criterion. A third one is semantic variation. So this criterion says that the dominant part of speech has more semantic variation, or in other words, more different senses. And the uh, problem with this is it's hard, kind of hard to determine what is a uh, word sense. And di different dictionaries would often disagree about this. And the fourth one is semantic dependency. So the idea is that the non-dominant non part of speech depends on having the other part of speech defined in order for uh, this one to uh, be definable. And what's the point of this? And the idea is that if all of these criteria degree, agree on the degree uh, direction of conversion, then, then we can say it's a directional process. Otherwise, we don't we really have evidence to say it's a directional process, and maybe it's better to say it's underspecified. And in this paper, we focus on the first one, frequency, and the third one, semantic variation. And we show that through corpus-based study that these two agree somewhat. So our contribution is we use deep contextual embeddings like BERT and ELMO and etc to quantify semantic distance and semantic variation. And we do this in a multilingual setting, so in 25 languages. Now, here's an example using BERT. Uh, each of these dots here is a word in the context of a sentence. So you feed a sentence through a bird, and then you get a contextualized embedding for every word. And depending on if this word is a noun or a verb, you color it uh, blue or orange. And on the left here, we have the word work. And you can see that these two 
uh, clusters are fairly overlapping because the noun work and the verb work are very similar in meaning. But on the other hand, on the right here, we have the word ring. And you can see that the nouns and verbs have very little overlap because the noun and verb meanings are very different for this word. Now, let's quantify this more formally. We use this to uh, measure how well does uh, uh, does our language models capture semantic information the, the way that we want. And the way we do this is we gather a list of flexible words. And for each one, we rate, uh, we have five humans rated and on how similar are the noun and verb meanings. So for example, uh, some words with high similarity are work, sleep, answer, and care. And some words with low similarity are ring, watch, train, and store. So these are the words where the noun and verb meanings are very different. And now we use uh, BERT and ELMO and XMLR to evaluate the noun and verb semantic distance. And then we use Spearman correlation to evaluate how similar are they to the human judgments. So if they're similar, then we can trust them to calculate our semantic variation for, for, our, uh, for our purposes. And the results is BERT and MBERT perform the best compared to ELMO and XMLR. And we find that the upper layers contain more semantic information than the lower layers. So the correlation gradually increases up until layer, layer five or so, and then it plateaus. So for the rest of the experiments, we're going to use the last layer of ambit. So that's the green line. Now for the data sets, we use the universal dependencies data set. This contains a lot of languages and 37 of them have over 100,000 tokens. And these come with part of speech tags. And we identify word class flexibility in 25 of the 37 languages. So we define this as if the proportion of uh, nouns that are flexible is above a certain threshold and the proportion of verbs that are flexible is also above this threshold, then we say that the language has word class flexibility. And interestingly, we find that in every language, the verbs are generally more flexible than nouns. And we combine this with the Wikipedia data set because the UD data set doesn't have enough data. So Wikipedia has a lot more data, but it's not part of speech tagged. So then we run all of the languages with UD pipe um, to get the part of speech tags for all of the Wikipedia data. Now we call that we are trying to show that the frequency and semantic variation criterion agree. Now, how do we measure this? The frequency one is fairly straightforward. Just count the number of verb and noun lemmas. But the semantic variation criterion needs some work to define it. So let's start with defining the semantic metrics. So for each lemma, we define the prototype noun vector as the mean of all the contextual vectors for all the noun usages. So you take all of the noun usages of a word, and then you feed them all through BERT, and then you get a bunch of contextualized vectors. And the mean of all of that is the prototype noun vector. Next, the noun variation is the mean distance from an average noun vector to the prototype noun vector. And we calculate this, of course, for nouns and verbs as well. And now the majority variation is defined as if the word is noun dominant, then the noun variation is the majority variation and the verb variation is the minority variation and vice versa if it's verb dominant. Now for the results. Now in 25 out of the, in 20 out of the 25 languages, we find that the majority variation is greater than the minority variation. And in other words, the frequency criterion agrees with semantic variation criterion greater than chance. So to see why this is true, um, the frequency criterion says that the uh, 
dominant one is the one that's more frequent. And then the semantic variation criteria says that the dominant one is the one with greater semantic variation. So if the majority variation is greater, then that means the two agree. And the majority variation is generally greater. So we can say that it's uh, agrees better than chance. And now you might be asking, well, uh, isn't the majority one, uh, isn't a bigger class uh, have higher variation because just by being bigger? So to account for that, we made sure that whenever we, we calculate these uh, variation metrics, we set the size of two classes to be the same size before um, before we calculate these metrics. So in order to move, remove that as a confound. So the conclusion of this is that word class flexibility is a directional process. So this gives some evidence towards the conversion theory of word class flexibility. So to conclude, in this paper, we use multilingual BERT to measure contextual semantic distances, and we do this across languages. And it turns out that this is useful for theoretical debates about word class flexibility. And hopefully in future work, it will be useful for other theoretical debates in linguistics as well. Thank you for listening, and we encourage you to check out our paper for more details. And finally, here's a list of linguistic references that we'll mention in the paper. Thank you.